real pleasure to welcome all the way from Scotland, Dr. Catherine Morrison. Thank you. Hi. Thank Thanks. You. Good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to actually be preaching to the converted uh, <laughs> without the, the hostility, actually, that goes from the majority of the medical profession when I start talking about low-carb diets or send my patients to them. This talk is going to tell you about how you can achieve your normal blood sugar and make a decision uh, on what your optimal blood sugar should be depending on the type of diabetic you are and your age and stage of life. Uh, many of your GPs and you're going to be coaching uh, a wide variety of patients, some of whom may or may not be suitable for this type of dietary intervention. I've been a GP for 31 years in the west of Scotland and I went to Natkins Diet 15 years ago. I was really just to lose a few pounds and I was amazed how immediately I felt much better cutting wheat out my diet, the brain fog, uh, actual bleeding gums, nail growth, everything improved. Irritable bowel syndrome just completely went away. And after reading a uh, more of Atkins work, I realised it had great potential for type 2s, put type 2s on it and got wonderful results. A typical sort of person would be haemoglobin A1c of 8.5, reducing to 6.5 over a couple of months. Uh, my son Stephen became diabetic just a year after that and that was fortunate because I had the experience with my type 2s to know that it would be absolutely crazy to put a type 1 on a high carb diet, as I was strongly encouraged to do. Uh, this has taken me, I've, I've met lots of uh, low carbers from various countries, uh, mainly virtually. I've co collaborated in papers, I've written a book, I run a diabetes education site, and I did the first uh, international comprehensive free course online for diabetics but it doesn't have the peer support or videos that I think the new one will in, in diabetes.co.uk uh, but it's on my diabetes site. Now ever since the uh, DCCT trial uh, was published towards the late 80s it has been found without a doubt that the better the your tighter blood sugars result in better outcomes in terms of glycemia and also complications are markedly reduced. And therefore, ever since then, all throughout the entire world, all guidelines suggest go for much better blood sugar control, not you know, good blood sugar control. Now, that can vary from like nice, say, uh, go uh, 6.5 or lower if you can avoid hypoglycemia to the American College of Family Physicians who are saying uh, haemoglobin A1Cs in the sevens uh, are perfectly okay if you've got type 2 diabetes. So there is a range of what is considered good control. And in pregnancy, nice, say, under 7%. But actually, uh, other organisations such the, um, as the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists go much tighter, and they say below 6%. But, now, although we can, we can argue, well, shouldn't these, you know, haemoglobin A1C of 7.9, is that really appropriate for a type 2 diabetic? Um, you can argue about that and we can argue ourselves blue in the face and you can say, well, actually, we should be headed towards much norm, more normal blood sugars. But the truth of the matter is we are nowhere near getting anything like what even uh, our international bodies think is good control. Uh, for instance, 15% of women in the UK are, have a haemoglobin A1C of uh, under 6.0%. 6. 6. 
and that is free health care, free drugs. Uh, they now get the free style Libre that's just come out. They are, this group of women are targeted for education and early referral to diabetes clinics and we are still abysmal. The result of this is that there's five times the fetal abnormality rate in these women. But by it the time it comes to birth, it's actually uh, more like one in two, uh, more than like um, double, sorry, the amount of fetal abnormalities due to selective termination of pregnancy. Even with the Daphne programme, so the so-called gold standard, you're only getting a 1% reduction in haemoglobin A1c on average. And I know that is an average, and some people will do a lot better than others. Nonetheless, for young people in the UK, between the ages of 16 and 25, average haemoglobin A1c is 10.1% and uh, nearly 40% of what is, of, is thought of is unacceptably bad control and it, nearly 80% have got poor control. Now you get much better results with a low carb diet. This is Richard Bernstein who's familiar to most of you and he goes for near normal blood sugars. In fact he achieves, you will get normal blood sugars on his regime. It is a ketogenic diet and it also uh, brings you down to much lower rates of hypoglycemia once you're stabilised. And he advocates the use of precision insulin techniques that I will describe to you later on in the talk. The idea of Bernstein's diet is that you're going to wiggle along normal by... Now, the normal is uh, 4.6 blood sugar for adults and 4.0 for children. So you're, what you're doing is you're having very little dietary carb, you're having small amounts of insulin and the mistakes you make in counting and insulin absorption are much less. So it ends, that is why although you're wiggling around normal, you have much less in the way of hypos. Whereas you have roller, if you're having large amounts of glucose in your diet, there's a, about, even if you're trained, about a 50% error rate in the amount car calculating your carbs, and there's about a 30% variability in the absorption of large amounts of insulin under the skin. And this is why you get roller coaster blood sugars. Now, a point about ketogenic diets, they do not cause diabetic ketoacidosis. You get this myth popping up from even consultant diabetologists. Dietary ketosis is due to a relative lack of dietary carbohydrate, but diabetic ketoacidosis is due to a relative lack of insulin. Now, DKA doesn't just happen in type 1s. It can, uh, if you get a type 1, you can have, sometimes you, if they become very ill with vomiting, you know to test for it. But some people you, who are young people, for instance, develop gastroenteritis. And it, they're actually developing, they're actually incipient type 1s. So it's important to test people that might fit the bill uh, do a blood, you know, a, a urinary glucose of people who are young with what looks like a bad gastroenteritis because ev basically every, you know, month you might read in the papers of someone who is misdiagnosed because it wasn't thought of. The other group that can get it are type 2s who are put on the glyphlazins. I have only seen one case uh, it's, not, it's not that common, but it is a side effect of the glyphosins, and I must have been using these drugs for about four years. No problem. I thought, well, I know about this, but ugh, it's not going to happen. It did happen. It happened relatively quickly to an, a new type 2, and I have no idea really why. Now, I like to give patients the most choice that I can. I... I'm as liberal as possible in my advice because I don't want anyone 
uh, following through the net saying, oh, that's, I'm not going to have 15 grams of carb three times a day. Um, that's not for me and dismissing the whole thing. You can get very good blood sugars on your more um, loose diet control. This is Jorgen Vesti Nielsen, who is the, the guy who has done the most in terms of long-term studies in type 1s and type 2s. And he basically got both type 1s and type 2s down to 6.4% 4, 4 or less. And that was after 44 months of treatment. And he again found that hypos were cut dramatically. So this, is, this is equates to 70 to 90 grams of carb a day. You can get normal pregnancies. In fact, Lois Jovanovic, who this is a young Lois, she's a, a, an old lady now, uh, she gets her patients down to a haemoglobin A1C of 5.3% on a low-carb diet, but she uses a lot of insulin, particularly in, obviously not once, just type 1s, but type 2s, and she backs that up with subcutaneous blood sugar meters with alarms to avoid hypos. And we're not set up for that in the UK at the present time. This is the Freestyle Libre. Um, and it's been available for about a year. And it's now the guidelines about when you can use it in the NHS have come out. And unfortunately, the group that is going to miss out are us and our patients <laughs> because <clears throat> we're striving for normal blood sugars and we are the ones who are going to be encouraging people to not get complications. So even though the NHS spends 80% of their diabetes budget on the treatment of complications and only 20% on basic care, they're not going to put the money into prevention for us, which is unfortunate. The ones who are getting it in my area, these are the Scottish guidelines. I don't know if it's going to vary across England. Uh, the only people that are getting the Freestyle Libre in my area are pre-pregnancy and pregnancy women. You can get it if you have three, uh, three admissions to hospital with either three D DKAs or three high post needing hospital treatment. And again, you're, when you are flitting around normal blood sugars, you're not going to be getting either of these. Mm. So I gave up and I, I bought my son the Freestyle Libre and it, it costs £1,140 a year uh, and that's VAT free. It gives you uh, your blood sugar at the time. It gives you a trend whether it's rising or falling. And if you put it by your bedside, it will actually tell you what your blood sugars have been overnight. But it doesn't have an alarm with it that would go off if your blood sugar went down past 3.5 or anything. Which is one of its drawbacks, but it, it's the best we've got at the, at the moment in the UK. Now, we've got the a very appalling eat well plate, as you all know. And unfortunately, when it comes to dietary advice for diabetics, this is like the front door. This is what dietitians are still saying to patients. Now, just very recently in Ayrshire, they decided that dietitians were not going to give dietary advice to uh, diabetics. They were simply going to use the diabetes conversion map and see what the patient wanted to see. But after their entire professional careers have been spent on mm. preaching this, that's, that's right, <laughs> I have no faith whatsoever that they're going to tell people uh, not to eat plenty of fruit and unhealthy fats, or, you know, like margarine and vegetable oils better than butter. And all the, and, give protein that's already got a lot of carbohydrate in it. So um, I, I have no faith in them, frankly. And we got in this mess mainly because of the, the, the dietary fat cholesterol hypothesis first really started off, I would say, by Ansel Keys. And that's a story which 
you'll know all about and is not really the subject. But what is the subject here is that although the front door is locked, <laughs> I would suggest, the back door is open. This is what NICE say in their guidelines about the criteria on which the diet should be based. So it's all to do with doing what the patient wants, looking after their long-term health, uh, looking after their heart, avoiding hypoglycemia, and uh, having a footing around hemoglobin A1Cs of 6.5 or so. And go lower if you can, but the, the blood sugar targets to do that are a pre-meal of four and a post-meal of five. And I am telling you, that you cannot do it on a high carb diet. You can only do this on a low carb diet. So before we go into the various sort of nuances of low carb diets, who is it not worth, you know, who is not going to engage with this or who is it maybe not worth it? I would say that people in the, you know, drug addicts, um, serious mental illness and again it's a shame because people with serious mental illness are often put on olanzapine and, and co which actually make them very insulin resistant and actually make them very fat and they make them into type 2 diabetics if they'll engage great in fact that would be wonderful but uh, not all of them are all that receptive if you are 70 when you're diagnosed and you're in good physical shape, I would say if your life expectancy is less than 10 years, you'll probably get away without having to worry very much about the carbohydrates in your diet. It takes about 10 years of even rubbish control before you get appreciable uh, complications such as interfering seriously with your vision or amputations and kidney failure and stuff. Between 10 and 20 years, the wheels start coming off. Uh, now, that doesn't mean they're not going to feel rotten and tired and have thrush and skin infections. They would get advantages, but I'm telling you, where, where are you going to put your energy? And this is a personal decision for the patients. But I would suggest that this maybe is, is a, the group that is perhaps not worth uh, the effort in many respects. But who is worth the effort? And I would say everybody else is worth the effort. The key to good control is consistency. And it's being consistent in everything you do. It's, I, it's best to have meals at the same time every day and have the protein, fat, and carbohydrate in those meals similar, such as most your breakfast. You can vary whether it's salmon or whether it's bacon and eggs and all this. Uh, but if you, um, if you can keep the macronutrient, rough, all the breakfast roughly the same, all the lunches roughly the same, and all the dinners roughly the same, it's easier to get control. I don't think anyone should be going over 45 grams of carb in any one meal. And for people who are insulin resistant, which is going to include most type twos, for instance, and adolescents, I would suggest your, your dawn phenomenon makes you more insulin resistant in the morning. I would suggest 15 grams of carb maximum at that meal. Uh, you're least insulin resistant at lunchtime so that you can go a bit higher, particularly if you follow that with exercise in the afternoon. So your 45 grams would be lunchtime. And your insulin resistance is somewhat in between in the evening, known as a dusk phenomenon, so go for about 30 then. You want to make exercise regular, a regular part of your life, and do it as consistently as possible. Sleep's very important. Even a couple of hours lack of sleep makes you more insulin resistant. It, makes, it puts your blood sugars out of whack. It makes you feel cranky and tired and it makes you crave carbohydrates. You need to monitor adequately and that for some type 2s will be just going to their doctor to get hemoglobin A1c 
once every three to six months. And for some type ones, we'll be testing 10 times a day. It depends on where you are. So this is, I've said, 45 gram maximum, and this is roughly what it looks like in terms of a refined carb. Now, these are moderate portions. Um, for instance, that amount of rice is about half what you might get if you went to an Indian restaurant and had a curry, at least in Scotland. <laughs> and, but look at what your Eat Well breakfast is, about 210 grams. Uh, so there's, and goes, I had to put a banana in there as well. So <laughs> it's, it's, although it's for, you know, if you're in 30 grams of carb a day, this looks astronomical, but it, not compared with what most people are eating. But I do think that all carbs are not created equal and you will be fuller, you'll have better nu nutrients, <laughs> it will be absorbed slower in terms of the glucose from it. And you'll get a lot more benefit from eating your vegetables, nuts and seeds and berries. So I would say that prioritise real food. And it's more important the lower you go in your carbs to prioritise real food. So what I'm going to describe three ranges of haemoglobin A1C and what you do to get there. So we'll go for what I think is looser control, 7 to 8%. Babies and toddlers. Babies and toddlers are erratic in their eating patterns and you often have to inject the in insulin after they eat. They're also more, uh, their brains are more affected by hypoglycemia. Adolescents are very, very insulin resistant and it's, particularly the girls, they have on average 2% haemoglobin A1Cs higher than their male counterparts during their teenage years. <coughs> Menstruating women in general have about haemoglobin A1C, about 1%, once they're adult women, 1% higher than the guys. But they can reduce it by getting rid of their periods, and I'm going to discuss that as well. And of course, occupational drivers, you must have a blood sugar of five to drive. And you can see that if you're testing, testing your blood sugar and making, oh, you're making sure you're over five all the time, you, that could push your haemoglobin A1C up. So this is an idea of what you'd be eating at 45 grams. I do think that exercise is very important and I would urge people to prioritise weight training because it builds muscle, therefore you can eat more in general and you can eat more carbs in general and get away with it. And it also makes you, more, makes you less uh, insulin resistant. But you can't weight train every day uh, because you need time for your muscles to recover. So I would say weight train every, other, every day or other day or every third day and fill in the other days with walking, cardio, stretching. You can stretch any time you like. Uh, all tennis, whatever, anything you like in between. There's enough days to fit in all the kinds of exercise you want. Now, talking about the women, right? Women's health and diabetes is a big issue. For a start, women need to get their weight normal before conception and they need adequate contraception so that they have time to get there. Uh, a very good advance is Loestrin 20, which is a combined pill. And if you take it every single day without a break, that stops your bleeding and it stops uh, the uh, progestogen rising that makes you insulin resistant every single month. So that's a great way of not becoming pregnant and getting rid of the, the problems with menstrual um, high blood sugars. You can't use it though, because it's a combined pill. If a woman's uh, BMI is over 30, I think obviously that if she's a bodybuilder, I think you're allowed. But if, if it's a, someone who is meant to be in the beast range, you're not meant to use it because of perceived increased arterial risk. Uh, there's other things. All the progestogen methods are suitable for diabetic women, but Depo-Provera makes you more insulin resistant and makes you put on weight. 
if you, what you'll notice with Depo is if the women that are going to put on weight, put on weight early. So once the first or second jags been done, if they're gaining weight, they're going to keep gaining weight. So they need another method. Uh, Cerizet can be used, uh, the progesterone only pill, but it's only got a 12 hour window. Uh, and if you miss it, you could become pregnant. So I advise people to take it in the morning because if they forget it, they've got all day to remember. But if they uh, take it at night, and the, the, the window's shutting all the time. All the implants are fine, gives you three years, and the marina gives you five years. So I'm going to talk about the middle group. Who would be fluttering around the nice target? Um, six to seven percent hemoglobin A1C. Now, although the American <coughs> College of Family Physicians would actually say all you know healthy type twos should be seven to eight, I would say that they can easily go from to six to seven, especially on a reduced carb diet. Experienced insulin pumpers have been given a lot of education, and they can get down here, but actually. When you actually get people using pens and give them the same education as is given to pump users, they get identical haemoglobin A1Cs. And primary school children, they are a great group for this because they're no longer babies. They live very routinized lives. Their mummies make them their, their uh, dinner. They get their school lunch. Even, even if they're having a high carb school lunch, it's not going to matter that much in the grand scheme of things. You spend half of your year as a child at school, another half at home. So it'd be a sixth roughly of your meals would be high carb. So no point in crying if your kid wants the same as everybody else. Go along with it. You can still get these blood sugars. And of course, this all goes to pot once the adolescent years strike. So let's have a look. This is what a 30 gram carb meal would look like. And this is, this is where Jorgen Vesti Nielsen was with his patients. Now, this is just a point of reference for this haemoglobin A1C. Blood sugar targets are lower for lower haemoglobin A1Cs and they're higher for people with looser control. But you can see that these levels are still quite tight. People will have to increase their blood sugar testing when... if they're not getting the blood sugars they want. Also, if they are worried about hypos, such as they're getting frequent hypos, or they're driving, they're doing exercise or sport. And when they're doing sport, it's a good idea to do what I, and instead of just being, obviously if you've got a low blood sugar, you've got to correct it with, immediately with glucose. But it's worthwhile when you're doing exercise to do what I call profiling, which is, you plan the activity, you keep everything else as same as possible, and you check your blood sugar every half hour. And what you're doing with profiling is trying to see what's happening to your sugars. And then you can have a more, instead of just reacting, have a strategic um, action plan about how you're going to deal with that. It does not make sense if you're trying to lose weight to eat carbohydrate to cover low blood sugars. If you're exercising your best, you have to do it immediately, of course, but if you're trying to lose weight, it makes more sense to cut your insulin, for instance. Uh, at any time when diet, medication and our insulin are being adjusted, and of course, during pregnancy. So now we want a wee normal baby, so we need to have near normal or normal blood sugar control. And this is not only applicable to women who want to have children, but if you want to reverse complications, uh, Dr. Bernstein has proven it. So have patients in his uh, forum. And I've had a couple of patients who had marked improvement in vision, and, or actually the eye changes, and uh, also neuropathy of the feet. So you can get improvements. And this is very important for ulcer healing. It's almost it takes maybe a week before you notice a difference, but you can see really quick improvements. If you're newly diagnosed and you want to keep your pancreas functioning as long as possible, going on the lower carb diets 
to get into really normal blood sugars is good because that will prolong your honeymoon phase. So this is what 15 grams or so looks like. And you're talking about mainly meat, fish, eggs, a lot of fat, uh, butter, cream, cheese, herbs and spices. You need to be creative so you don't get bored. I now want to speak about insulin precision meal to insulin matching. And this is a subject all on its own. And I do, I do spend a lot of time in the books and in the courses telling you exactly how to do this. It's not that relevant to all, to type twos and maybe the majority of your patients very relevant to type ones. So again, you're going to eat three meals a day. You are going to have five hours between each meal. That is so that the insulin you inject for your meal has finished working by the time you have your next meal. And the ideal way to do that is to have seven units or less with each shot. You can have multiple shots, but only little boluses. And that will get your pens working just as efficiently as if it was a pump. And people go, oh my God, all these jags. It, there's other advantages, they're less painful. You eliminate hypo, uh, hypo, uh, skin lipoatrophy and um, lipohypertrophy, which in their own way then make insulin absorption less predictable. So that is uh, something that's very useful. You're going to use protein to cover certain types of food. It often works, but regular insulins, and the two that are useful in the UK are Hypurin Soluble and Humulin S. If you are having, say, two or three lamb chops, it's about seven units. If you are eating pizza, pasta, and lasagna, which I believe in at least giving people the option, this, these are much better insulins to use for it. A pizza takes eight hours to digest. Someone, a diabetologist spent a lot of time learning that, so eight hours. For a pizza, a steak, 10 hours. A big steak, 10 hours. So you can see that actually what you need to do is work out how much you need and actually give a jag at the beginning and a jag about halfway through. It's very, you're not going to, you're actually to cover these meals. So you're actually going to be doing a split Jags. Fiasp has just come out. It's the new Novanapid. It works a wee bit quicker than Novanapid. Now, the idea with when you're using uh, the rapid acting insulins to cover meals and starch is that it's a Gaussian curve. You eat the starch or sugar, blood sugar goes up and then it goes down. And the idea with these fasting acting insulins, it, uh, insulin goes up and then it goes down. And Bernstein says it's like trying to get two, you know, like the Pythons in St. Lucia, the big sticky up mountains. It's like trying to get two very steep hills to coincide. It's very hard. And I'll tell you that my son, Stephen, says that the FIASP doesn't cover, it doesn't actually, you still get better results if you inject it before you eat. Just as a point, just as a little point. Levimir twice a day or and if you've got bad insulin resistance three times a day, gives you best basal, the flattest basal picture using pens. And this is an art form getting this right. This is simply to introduce you to the subject that covering low carb diets is a different ball game from covering high carb diets, especially when you're going for precision control. 